Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Christiane Ono, and I'm the program coordinator for the Japan America Society of Hawaii. On behalf of JASH, I'm excited to welcome you to today's virtual workshop, Edible World, Nature That Nurtures Us, co-hosted by the Japan America Society and the Akakiao Nature Institute. Um, before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, first, this Zoom meeting will be recorded and shared on our JASH YouTube channel. Um, to minimize background noise, please keep your microphones muted unless you'd like to share during the discussion portions of our workshop today. Um, you may keep your cameras on throughout the program, and we encourage you to do so, especially during the discussion portion of this workshop. And you are welcome to use the Zoom chat during the presentation to comment or ask questions. Um, we really appreciate and encourage the, the interaction. So Josh met the team at Akahiao through our Asian Pacific Children's Convention, or APCC, an annual international camp for 10 to 11 year olds in Fukuoka, Japan. Um, to prepare for our to prepare our Ford Hawaii Junior Ambassadors for the 2021 virtual program, um, which was centered around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we visited Akahiao Nature Institute's Huehue Ranch for a weekend in July to prepare our delegation to share about Hawaii with other students in Japan and around the Pacific region. Um, so joining us this morning, Akahiao's program team includes Jeff Fuchs and Liana, Liana McDonald Kainoa. Jeff is Akahio's resident explorer and program coordinator. He is a North Face ambassador and award-winning Canadian explorer whose journeys have been described by National Geographic Traveler as one of the top 50 journeys of a lifetime. Liana is Akahio's community outreach coordinator and cultural liaison. She is a modern Kanaka Maui from Hawaii Island who's deeply passionate about embracing Aloha Aina and the Hawaiian culture. She sees the importance of environmental education and outreach and is committed to engaging with Keiki and the community to expand Aina-based learning. We're excited to partner with Jeff and Liana in this virtual Edible World workshop series to bring a taste of their amazing programming to you all at home. So without further ado, I would now like to turn the program over to the Akahiao team. Welcome and thank you, Christiane. Thanks for everyone that's braving getting online on a, on a weekend to be with us. Um, I won't say too much other than to just say that I'll let Leanna do a little talk too, but I'll be speaking specifically about how nature nurtures some of the mental aspects. And again, I'm not a clinical physician, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I have been dealing with outdoor exploration, taking groups into the Himalayas, hosting groups on the big island. So I'll speak more of the hands-on experience, the very simple witnessing of how nature has affected not only our youth groups, but in turn have affected relationships amongst themselves with us, with us amongst ourselves. Um, I'll speak to the interconnectivity of that. And that's, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll let and to Liana speak a few words as well. Aloha everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Josh, thank you for hosting this. And Christiane, thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, this is our part two of our Edible World series. And our topic today is nature that nurtures us. And for me personally, I mean, all I can share is my own experience and how nature has really had an impact on my life and in countless numbers of ways it has. I really truly believe that nature is our greatest teacher. For me personally, it has been that element, that guide that has always pushed me, challenged me. Um, it's been therapeutic when I needed it the most and it's always been there. And so there's a quote that I heard uh, some time ago that says our relationship to nature is infinite because no matter what we do, uh, how long we ignore it, it will always be there when we return. And so thus it's really important for us to really sustain that relationship because if we don't pay attention to it, you know, when we come back, it will be there, but it's going to be in a different condition. So um, I really believe that it's a reflection of ourselves. And that's all I'll say about that. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how Hue Hue has 
nurtured our uh, programs and our mental, physical, spiritual well-being. Um, so Jeff is going to introduce the first part of this. Yes, this is the fun part of the psychology, the mental aspects. Um, I see Yuki is here, and hi, Yuki. Yuki and I have talked a lot about this idea, and Yuki does it particularly well, speaks about the third culture. And I think I'll start there because it's something I was thinking about last night here in California. And one of the aspects at Hui Hui with our youth groups, of course, the cultural aspects are important to Hui Hui, a sense of place, a sense of culture of that land, its history. But one thing about nature generally, the interaction with um, humans and nature generally, is that it is irrespective of culture to some degree. We all have an interpretation of nature in a different way. That, of course, has to do with our culture. But maybe to the quote, and I didn't know about this quote of Liana's before, it, it's infinite. One thing we've watched is that time and time again, children from inner cities, children from Big Island, children from Fukushima area of Japan, children from China, we've had kids from all over the world. That relationship they have with nature or the relationship they do not have with nature, when it starts, it's almost sacred. Um, and and there, I mean, I could draw comparisons between kids from Fukushima as an example, kids from Big Island, kids from inner city Philadelphia. And yet there is a similar interconnection. Um, let children wander, let them be in the open spaces and they start to get it. And one of the aspects which is really important for us, I think, to, to promote, we're asking a new generation of children to care for the environment, which is polluted, which has been desecrated, which has been forgotten. And yet we don't often provide them with enough access to nature. And that's difficult when you live in a huge inner city. But one of the things we're trying to do is just to give the kids time. We're not trying to over-program or over-regulate. Of course, that's up to other people to discipline the children. Our main intention is to get the kids actually outside, breathing air, looking around, smelling things, plucking, harvesting from the garden, and not over-explaining, again, not over-regulating, and certainly not trying to dictate what the children choose to interpret or see or taste. We're trying to basically provide a corridor, I feel, an access point for youth. I'll, I'll move on to something we do with every group that for me is, is the most exciting. It's where we get to find out a little bit about each individual, each group. We do an orientation walk. And while the walk is a physical walk, of course, through the forest, it's about 40 minutes through the forest, up through the property that we have, it is actually about stimulating conversations. And it is amazing to see students who are self-described introverts, self-described antisocial uh, in nature. It's phenomenal to see them within the context of nature start to have conversations. And the comfort level, I, my experience with watching groups is certainly that the comfort level in a natural environment always seems to be much more robust, honest, easy. There's less small talk when one is walking through a forest or looking at a fence line or talking about the history of, a, of an old piece of ranch land. And so our orientation walks, while they're physical, while we're introducing, particularly Auntie Liana is introducing the diversity, the biology of the property. What I see again and again is the orientation walk, I, I feel is the perfect introduction, not only to the place, but for a lot of children to themselves and to their interactions with others, their, their little society. Um, during these walks, we have two areas. 
in particular in the forest where the kids inevitably seem to want to settle. And so what we've realized during these orientation walks is that the walks shouldn't have a time limit. We shouldn't have a period of time and limit it. So some of these orientation walks have taken a couple of hours while the kids sit down and debate whatever they want, current issues, the state of their household, talking about themselves. And so these become not only orientation walks, they become introductions to self, to values. And I think there's something about nature which always is there to listen. Um, people aren't always good at that. I'm not always good at that. Um, when you're introducing yourself to people, I think people sometimes feel rushed that they have a two minute period or a one minute period, nobody wants to hear my story. What I've seen again in the natural environment is that people generally tend to relax. They listen. I think the topics of conversation are more far ranging, more wide ranging. People feel a, a sense of a sanctuary of a safety. And I go back to the idea, and I'll, and I'll close it up here, just by saying that I think a great realization over the past few years of running a Kahiao programming for kids from all over the age range, be they five, six years old, be they teenagers, provocative in all ways. One thing we've realized is that just getting people outside, not explaining it, at the beginning, just getting them outside, moving, small explanations, not over being overly rigid about what they see, just letting, letting them see, letting them discuss, letting them tinker in the garden. This has allowed us, me, to, to continually remind myself not to over-program, to let youth experience nature, open environments in their own way. And then after that, the programming I find is much easier. It's almost like we go through a, a transformative phase just by walking through the natural elements and then we're, we're ready to do programming. Uh, and programming can be, it's not as though things change, but I think the kids have a better sense of space where they belong in it. And, and I go back to that idea of a sort of a sacred sanctuary so I'll leave it there because I could yap all day long and it is a weekend. Don't want to do that. Um, please, at the end, if you've got questions or comments or, or whatever, points, things you've seen, I'm available, Nan is available, but for now I'll just transition off to Christian. Um, we've, I've prepared a little video with the help of others. Enjoy. So often we talk about the, the healing properties of nature and that they're not simply medicinals, we're talking about the healing properties of an entire space, a whole space which is interconnected. And what we found here during camps, during programs, during walks, during meals in the woods is that simply being in the space having a conversation in the space sometimes is the key transition point. It doesn't have to be a complex program. It doesn't have to be an introduction to biology even. It can just be simply sitting in the space around us. Over here, there's a thatch of invasive Christmas berries which provide a perfect little nook and cover point. Students have had raucous debates, arguments, discussions about life, parents, each other. These places provide our, our sort of, uh, our version of a classroom. Over here we have a vined area, which is essentially a crawl space that kids have cleared out within and created this almost tunnel system. And again, 
It's within such spaces, amidst such space, where there is a kind of a sanctuary and a safety spot. And to a degree, this is the most unscripted and understated of strengths that nature provides us with. It's not necessarily knowing every fauna, flora, and vine. Sometimes it's just being amidst the elements. One of the great moments uh, for us at Akakiao was with a, a, a small group of local children. We were just taking a walk and we came upon this little area that we here know about, but the kids kind of repurposed this area and suggested that if we wanted to have a, a real conversation, we should go in within the safety in this, of this sanctuary. And this became the Green Fort. And so what started off as a, as a basic idea with a small group became something that was transmitted and continued throughout each program. So each program that comes here not only goes and clears out a little more to make the area more expansive, to make it more conducive to conversations, it, it's also been a space where I think a lot of the youth feel easy speaking about topics, about values and the conversations don't have to be about nature themselves they can be about each other so come on in this has been prepared by the interior design team called youth incorporated And so it's in this little sanctuary that I feel, at least, that youth has been provided an opportunity to truly feel safe. We talk so much about forest bathing as though it's some sort of silent retreat. In the way I view it, I view it as just simply being within the forest space, a natural space in order to have conversations. Be silent if you wish. But this has become our little, almost like a council table where we can, uh, we can get into topics. Kids can look at the shapes. They can smell the bark. They can look at the floor of the leaves. They can clear twigs away. They can listen to the winds. And they can fantasize about one day having a sleepover in a camp here, which is inevitably what most groups come to the conclusion of, that they want to spend more time here. And even Momo finds a sanctuary. Our mascot, our loyalist, now covered in birds. We brought a, a group up here a few weeks ago and it was one of the more inspiring moments I've had because we have all these ideals, we have all these lessons, we have all of these fantastic places we want to introduce, these times and spaces we want to introduce to youth. And yet often it's us being instructed by youth. Sometimes we're reminded, I was reminded, that simply to get youth out here that first step, that deed, that duty is the most important. So we had a moment of, okay, so this is a space. We want each of the youth to find their own nook, their little safe spot out of sight of one another. And we had a young girl 
find this nook and we gave him 15 minutes to write thoughts down to listen and she was over here and when she came back she one of the great gifts that youth gives us is just being forthcoming and straight up so she came out of that spot back to us and she's been here before to other programs and she simply said that's the first time in my life I've had moments to just calm down, breathe, listen, and feel safe. And so with all of the complex design thinking workshops that we sometimes do, with all the values workshops that we do, with all of the farm to table cooking and recipes and pieces of information that we want to impart, sometimes it's those moments that you feel the spirit is moved and that just providing that moment, that's maybe the biggest gift we can provide. And it's there and then that we find that nature gives the greatest gift of, of all, a sanctuary, a restorative sanctuary. Right. So we hope you enjoyed that video. One thing, I, do you have anything you'd like to add, Jeff, before I move on? Oh, just to thanks for the patience of watching through that. I realized it was getting a little artistic at times, but that's part of the beauty. No, I feel, nothing to add. I feel calm after watching it. It was really, you know, you, you actually can sense, you know, the space that you're in. Um. So this next part, um, I'm also going to share a short video, and it takes place in our garden, which is one of the primary learning centers of Hue Hue and of the programs. And our director, Julie, she is, um, she really emphasizes connecting with food, because that's our direct connection with nature. It's what sustain us, sustains us, it provides for us. And that's always been really important with the programs and having the kids actually harvest the food, cook the food, offer that food to their peers. And we've adjusted a little bit due to the pandemic and COVID, but we still spend a lot of time in the garden doing service learning projects and I feel that we have a lot of fun there. It's bright, it's colorful, it's abundant, it's full of biodiversity. And without having to share too much, a lot of times they share a lot with us and we learn from them as well. And from my own experience working in the environmental field, I was told by one of my mentors that, you know, once you learn the plants around you, and you connect with them, you get to know them, no matter where you go, you'll identify the same type of plants around the whole world. And so I really do uh, feel that when I go to other places, if I'm visiting the mainland or wherever it is, and I recognize a plant, you automatically feel a little bit more comfortable in that space. Or you're like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, I, I know that. And so I've experienced that and it does make a difference in your own physical space as well. This next uh, video is more informative. It's sharing some of the plants that we have in the garden, some of the health and pr practical benefits of those plants. Mm. And one more thing I wanna point out, what I really appreciate about working with Okahiao and at Hue Hue and learning from, you know, our mentors and teachers there that uh, I've really developed a more holistic relationship with plants. Here in Hawaii, so many plants get a bad rap for being invasive and 
I mean, maybe they are. However, a lot of them have a lot of functions and uses, whether they're medicinal, um, most of them medicinal, and you'd never know because you're always told that's a weed, pull it out. And so I've developed a much healthier relationship with some of those plants and seeing um, them for what they are, how they can help us, how we can work with them um, in a healthier way instead of you know battling certain plants. Um, so yeah, enjoy the next video. And yeah. E komo mai. Welcome to Hui Hui's garden. Let's take a look at some of the medicinal and practical plants. This is mullen. Mullen has been around for centuries, and the flowers and leaves were used on animals and people for a variety of issues, including cough, congestion, bronchitis, and asthma. The leaves can be used for toilet paper if needed. The next plant we have is the lufa, and I thought I would include this because it's a really fun plant, and we're very familiar with this. You see the synthetic ones being sold at the store, but in fact, the true lufa is a vine, and it is related to the pumpkin and the squash. Once the fruit is dried, you can peel off the outer layer, revealing the spongy-like substance inside, which you can use for exfoliating. You can also use it as a sponge for washing your dishes. Be sure to shake out your loofah to find any seeds that might be hiding inside. You can use them for next year. Next, we have Tulsi basil or holy basil. This plant acts as a powerful adaptogen. An adaptogen is a natural substance that helps your body adapt to stress and promotes mental balance. All parts of the plant can be used. However, it is commonly used as a tea. And next we have garlic chives, which has a range of beneficial nutrients, including anti-cancer effects. Next, we have the soursop, which is packed with vitamin C and antioxidants to boost your immune health. The vitamins strengthen your immune system and it improves your ability to defend against pathogens. It can also promote the destruction of free radicals, which can protect your skin and cells from environmental damage. The eggplant. One of the benefits of eggplants are that it helps balance your blood glucose levels. Because of its rich fiber content, it can slow down the release of glucose in the bloodstream. Next here we have lavender, which is popular in use for aromatherapy, and it's simple as breaking off a leaf or a branch, crushing it in between your fingers, and inhaling its sweet aroma, which can give you a nice mental boost. Next, we have comfrey. Although this plant contains poisonous chemicals, the leaf root and root-like stem are used to make medicine. It is used as a tea for upset stomach, ulcers, heavy menstrual periods, diarrhea, and so much more. It can also be used to gargle for gum disease and sore throat. So here I am making my way past the cassava and these beautiful pollinator plants and over to the neem tree. I'm sure you've heard of neem oil, which can be used to deter bugs on your plants, but it can also be applied topically and it is great for your skin. Next, we have Moringa. Moringa is native to India, and it has many vitamins and minerals. The leaves have seven times more vitamin C than oranges and 15 times more potassium than bananas. It also has calcium, protein, iron, and amino acids. It's also packed with antioxidants and substances that protect your cells from damage. It can also boost your immune system and lower blood pressure. It is also said that it has anti-cancer properties.
Lastly, we have the kalo. The kalo is a staple in the Hawaiian diet and it has been around for thousands of years. It supposedly originated in Egypt. However, this plant has spiritual significance to Polynesians as it is said that the kalo is our oldest and eldest brother, Haloa, who was a stillborn of Sky Father and Earth Mother. Mahalo for joining us. Until next time, ahuiho. All right. So that's going to kind of lead us into the third part of today's presentation, which is a tea leaf lay workshop. Um, and you saw there at the end, we have a tea leaf patch that surrounds the emu there. And if you have collected some tea leaves today, you can follow along with me. I wanted to talk a little bit about the plant itself. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with tea or ki. In Hawaiian, the name is la'i. And tea leaf was introduced by Polynesians and they have been using it for such a long time. It was a really important plant for them because it had so many different uses. And so some of those uses besides making lei or adornments for special occasions, of course, it was used to wrap food, um, lao lao. It was also used um, for capes, rain capes, um, sandals, pa'u, hula skirts. Um, the root can actually be made into a fermented alcoholic type beverage called okolehau. And medicinally, it has a really amazing ability to draw heat from the body. So what they used to do anytime a baby or someone had a fever, they would lay the leaves all over the person's body and you let it sit there. And after a while, the leaves will surely draw heat from the body and remove the fever. I think that's why it's also really good with high heat temperatures for cooking. Um, once you remove those leaves from a person, they'll actually be really soft and, and pliable. Um, and for myself, if I'm hiking somewhere in the islands and I'm off trail or somewhere that's more Malka, kind of in the mountainous areas um, or valleys, and I come across a lot E, I'm a little bit more careful because a lot of times it will signify a sacred site. It was also used to delineate certain boundaries and kind of used as a marker. It grows very, very easily. You can literally cut the stem off, stick it into some soil, and you'll, you'll have another tea leaf um, growing from that. And so because of that, all those reasons, super special. It was also used during ceremonies by kahunas. So some of that is obviously still being practiced today. I haven't tried okolehau, but I heard it's kind of like, doesn't taste all that great. So if anyone has tried it, please share your experience. Um, so yeah, the, the tea leaf lei, the lei is something that's super special to Hawaii. And anytime there's a special occasion, it's your way of showing love, appreciation, and gratitude to a person or a place. So this is something that we wanted to share with you. We do workshops with students, especially students that are um, from out of state to really share that part of the culture with them and they make tea leaf lays as well. So a couple of things when it comes to making a lay, you want to be sure you're harvesting your material from a place um, where you, that's either meaningful to you, you have permission, or you're doing it sustainably. We always want to only take what we need and never over harvest um, one area. 
and you kind of want to rotate, you know, where you pick your material from. And lace can range from all sorts of things. It can be leaves, flowers, shells, nuts, vines, um, cordage. So it really depends. The tea leaf is the most basic. I'm sure we've all made one um, before. It's something we learned growing up here in Hawaii. Uh, and yes, and before you pick, you always want to ask permission from the plant, um, spiritually and you know, out loud. Just a simple like asking, and then when you feel like you've received a, an answer in your way, you can go ahead and pick your material. So I went and collected leaves yesterday um, from my boyfriend's parents' house. It's been pretty dry here, so uh, a lot of our plants have been kind of uh, fried from the fog, and we haven't really been getting a whole lot of rain out here. Um, so. Yes, okay, you have your leaves. And then the first thing you wanna do, I'm gonna shift a little bit here so you can kind of see. Um, this is Kyle, he's gonna help me with a portion of the lay making. <laughs> Say hi, Kyle. Aloha everyone, good morning. Um, okay. So the first thing you wanna do when you have your tea leaf is you need to debone it. So there's various ways of doing it. You can always make a little notch and then pop the stem out that way, or you can do the easy way and cut it along both edges. And you actually wanna cut from the top down. So not from the stem up because that will tend to fray the leaf. Uh, so you just want to cut it like this. And you want to find the greenest ones possible. And it takes about, let's say five to six tea leaves to make a lay. Just to add something. Every time Auntie Leanna does the lays, there's always boys for the first time who inevitably roll their eyes. That's not for me. That's not something I want to do. And I can tell you every boy who does it, they're a little bit shy at the end, but when they have a lay that they've done with their hands using leaves, when they have it in their hands, they're glowing and they often make more than one. So I just That's throwing cool. that in. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. The boys are, they're great, you know, at crafting and doing the weaving part. And so I always encourage them to like, you know, try making cordage someday because um, it's similar. So once you have your leaves cut, there are different ways to make it pliable because you want it soft. And what I did for these, I stuck them in a plastic bag last night and put them in the freezer. And then when they thaw out, they're really nice and soft. However, for quick and easy way, you can use the iron and literally iron your leaf. I find that this works really well. This is to me the second best option. You can also microwave them with wet paper towels or you can boil them. From what I found, boiling takes more time. So, you know, the iron I think is a great go-to. So if you have leaves with you now and you wanna go ahead and iron yours, um, go ahead and do that. And you simply just, you know, couple strokes over and boom, they're soft and ready to go. Um, so let's see. All right. Then what you're gonna do is take two leaves, kind of wanna find one that's similar in length. And there's a couple of ways to do this um, first part. You can simply tie it or, cause most times we use our toes 
as an anchor, you can wrap it around a loop around your toe with one leaf. So you would twist this, twist, 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 twist. And then you would anchor this around your toe and then start your lay that way. So you would kind of have a puka like that. And at the end, you can pop a knot through there, the other end to fasten it. Um, but for today, Kyle's gonna assist me and he's gonna hold for me so I don't have to use my feet. Um, so you just tie a simple knot. Um, just pull the knot like that. I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer. Okay, so I hope you can see this part because now we're gonna actually, what we call willy or willy, which means a twist. So let me put it down here. And the way that I do this, um, I mean, it's just simple. Once you get a hang of it, you're gonna just be like banging out lays. Okay, so you're gonna twist in the same direction. I go to the right, so same direction. And then you pass one over, one strand over, one strand under. Is that visible? I'm sure. And then I keep my fingers close. Um, so I have more control over the twist. If, you, if it's out here, it won't twist as well. And I do each twist with every turn. I know some people, it's all preference, but you can, you know, twist it first, but I don't really like to do that. I like to twist as I go. So I think it makes a nicer um, weave or braid. And you'll notice that it's starting to get sticky <laughs> and some of the moisture is coming out. So you can see it's got like a nice little twist to it like that. And this worked out perfectly today because I'm going to a memorial later for our uncle who recently passed and we are like, bring a lay. So this will be a meaningful lay for me to make today and give it to the ocean later. Um, okay, hold it still. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you once you get to the end of your leaf, you need to add on another. So yeah, you, like you can see, it's all repetition. Once you get the, the hang of it, it just goes. I say it's all in the wrist. You just twist like that. And then if you wanted to, what we do um, with our groups, they'll pick flowers or anything with color and you can add that in. You can braid that in as you go to make it a little more fancy. This is a simple single strand lay. And yeah, it gets really sticky. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you can see, you probably wanna have a towel nearby. It does get a little messy. And then when you wanna add another leaf in, you always add to the one on top, never the one on the bottom. So you lay it over and then you just twist it in as if it were the same leaf. And you just keep on going. This other side's getting small. So I'm gonna add to that one. Let's see. This part's a little tricky. You just want to make sure you're holding, um, holding it tightly so it doesn't fall out. And there's going to be a little part that sticks out. I really love that. I think it's pretty and it adds to the lay. Um, but if you don't want that, you can always add it in lower so it's not visible, or you can just trim these off at the end. Maybe can you hold it back a little?
And so lei in Hawaiian figuratively also means beloved child, parent, family member, relative, sweetheart. Um, so there's a lot of ourself that goes into making a lei. It, it takes time, especially if you're making more um, complex lays. So they say in Hawaiian culture, like a part of our spirit goes into this. And, you know, we gift that to someone when we gift them a lay. And um, when you receive a lay, it's pretty heva to toss it in the trash. Like, you know, we, we, we throw rubbish in the trash. And so if you can and you're able to, when you're ready to discard your lay, you wanna remove anything that's um, not biodegradable and you wanna give it back to the aina. And that's, you know, that's the part of giving back and returning it to the earth and being sustainable. And that energy and all of that person's mana, you know, is, is honored in that way. So even when you're done making your lei, like any extra material you have lying around, you also want to give that back. Um, give it back to the earth. Don't toss it in the trash. So... I'm going to finish this one up here. It's pretty small. That was only like two leaves, I think. Yeah. Um, it kind of fits. You always want to like test it out first. But you can really just loop tie it around the other end to fasten it. Or if you made a loop, you know, make a, um, a knot at the end and pull it through the loop. Let me add on to this one later. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's the lei la e, and this is great for any occasion. You know, I feel like tea leaves are pretty accessible. They're easy to find. They're easy to make, and it's a thought that counts. So if you have the opportunity to make one instead of buying one, it's always a better option. Yeah, and if you wanted to, you could do a double strand where you make a couple of these and you can weave them and um, braid them together. And there's other pieces you can add on, like people make little roses that you can add on to the, to the end there to fasten it. And you can even add like little roses, tea leaf roses um, on as just an extra adornment. But yeah, this is it. The ones that you see for the head are called le po'o. And if you have one for your wrist or your anklet, that's called a kupe'e. Yeah. Thanks for your help. Okay. <laughs> so I hope someone was able to follow along or if that was helpful. That was it's beautiful. And we didn't preset this. Liana and Kyle did this all sort of <laughs> spontaneously. Well done. Thank you. So what time are we at? Yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, we can do Q&A or talk story for the next five, seven minutes. Did anyone dislike the lay? <laughs> Let me start with a provocative question. Yeah. <laughs> No, I actually saw, and I see that Regan is here, by the way, I have to special uh. call out to Regan. Um, I have to say one of the flashiest lays I've ever seen. Again, young boy, just saying. Mm -hmm. He had more colors and woven flowers in, and he was one of those boys who said, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do this. Yeah. What is it? And, 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 and. And he ended up doing something with a little bit of bling. Yeah, yeah we, <clears throat> we did this with about 125 high school students this summer from the mainland. And every single one made a lay. 
like, even if it was a little tough at first, they, they're, you know, they're into it and they appreciated, they appreciated the practice. So that was cool to see. Any questions or even, well, I can put any, have all of you on this call, I know some of you, I know most of you actually, so there might be a, not a great question. Have you all had a moment, one of those moments in nature where things slow down um, and one of two things happens, either complete anxiety and panic or a bliss of no responsibilities just briefly? Has everyone had that? I hope. I hope not the anxiety part because I've seen people get stressed out because it's actually too relaxed. We, we had, it was a sad one, uh, a young girl, she started crying. Um, and I kept thinking, did someone say something offensive and she's just being polite and not saying anything? No. And she explained that she said it was just walking at some point and she started thinking about things and she processed a whole lot of stuff. Anyway, hopefully all of you have had those opportunities and it doesn't have to be at a Cahiel, although we'd love to have you um maybe part of the bigger discussion of what we're talking about today is just encouraging all people to I'm not going to say tune out to listening but there's certainly people in our lives that probably we could all tune out and spend a bit more time in the trees and the grass on the beach and the water One thing to add, we have a policy, and I hope this isn't going to turn some of you off of a kahia, but we have a policy of certain times during the day, no phones, no screens, nothing. I know, tough. However, it's amazing how many youth, adults, when they're engaged with something else, meaningfully engaged, they actually don't need their phones. I mean, yes, later on at night, immediately, the screen gets popped up, the light goes on, and yes, whacking out 13 messages in a record 12 second period. However, during the day when it's no screen time, it's amazing how many youth, how many of us don't actually need the phone. And we had one young, again, a boy who was on his phone nonstop say, actually, it's only, when I'm engaged, when I'm doing something, I'm not thinking about being on the phone. So that's your responsibility. And he was pointing at me. So. So part of the responsibility of providing an optional way of living at, during the day is the responsibility of people like us. And um, it is meaningful. Oh, Riggins chatting, just a minute. Okay. And we did a little lay making session where we got to choose between tea leaf lay and a raffia bracelet. And I made tea leaf the only trouble. I had was ending it. <laughs> yes. Reagan, where is that lay now? <laughs> Did you throw it out or is it somewhere snaking around the house? All seven feet of it. Oh, he's got it. Oh, he has it. dried out right now because I made it a while ago. Wow. Oh, wait, where's. Oh, cool. Very nice. Nicely done, Reagan. Good job, Regan. I noticed you've changed your hairstyle as well. However, this is not the time to get into that, but <laughs> hair looks good, lay looks good. Um, Any questions uh, or comments or just additions? Um, I have one. I was wondering, hi, everybody. I'm Nina Marie. Hi, Hi anyway. Liana. Let's see you guys. <laughs> Good to see you. I was just wondering, how do we get, how, how can we come up to Okahiao and help out or whatever? Oh my <laughs> God. The it's a huge process. Uh, Is it? Maria. It takes Is months. It very, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of bureaucracy up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, papers and more papers. And it sounded like a very overregulated place. Did you write down the video? <laughs> Are you on island? I'm on Oahu half the time, but I'm on the big island half the time. I'm in, oh. So I'm there a lot and would love I, to come up. Yeah. Well, let's connect and chat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And by coming up to Hui Hui, you don't, you're not obligated to work, by the way. Just, you can just do some walking around. However. I definitely want to help. 
no, loads, I wouldn't help. loads to do. Yes. I'm sure. I know how it goes. No, no, I'd love to do both, but yeah, I would but love to just support what you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah, the work is awesome. fun too. I know it is. And I, I have a lot of giving back to do. I'm like, I'm not taking care of, you know, the Ina enough. So I feel like it's important to make those days to give back, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'm overdue. A <laughs> place. I think that's the most important. And yes, I hope it's okay for me to share. I think Julie's on here, but we are planning a native restoration site, which I'm really mm. excited about. We've identified a handful of native plants that were previously established either on their own or maybe they were planted some time ago. So that's kind of cluing in what the ecosystem might have looked like before. And we're able to kind of figure out like what type of native plants we want to put back into the ground. So that's really exciting. Maybe that could be a cool project. Um, That'll be awesome. You need to help out with and starting to reforest a little bit and bring back some of those native trees. That sounds awesome. Congrats. Where, where is the funding coming from to get native plants? Is it going to be donation or repop? I'm assuming a lot of the plants are not there. You're planning to bring them back or you found them there. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. So what is there if we can source seeds from those trees? Mm -hmm. We may not be able to right now. We might have to wait, you know, for the season. That's the best option. Um, there is a, a friend and a neighbor who has a nursery uh, next to the property who grows native mm -hmm. plants. And so because it's already kind of acclimated to that climate, we're hoping to source plants there. And for funding, I think it's going to depend on our partnerships, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's public or private or we're going to figure that out because, um, yeah, we will need to get Quite a quite a few trees. Once yeah. planting, it goes pretty pretty fast at times. You can get through a lot. And Nina Marie, just back to the yeah. funding thing. As you know, I mean, the state is a pretty good place to be because there is a, a lot of sort of inherent bartering systems on Big mm -hmm. Island, especially. You do this, you come and do this, we'll do this. So to some degree, and I, and I think that there's a a consolidated philosophy to get natives back in. Liana in particular, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're, we're lucky to have her is her background is in native restoration. Mm -hmm. So we wanna keep it, unlike our application process, which is very bureaucratic, this is not. <laughs> no. Awesome, so it'll be, I love that. Yeah, like grassroots, <laughs> that's yeah. the best way. That's it the is. best way. It is, and it's also a way of making the property and the space accessible. We don't want yeah. this to be a beautiful, isolated little pocket of land that people don't feel are is accessible to them or useful. Um, it, it has to have people on it to invigorate it, so. Absolutely. What What is just the brief history of that spot of land that you guys are on? How did you, how the program get, you know, to work, to be stewards of it? Mm, Julie, who's my wife, who's lurking somewhere in here, interesting no image um her family acquired the land it was an old land ranch hui hui was a a very extensive ranch in the in the days of old um mm -hmm. they used a lot of roundup uh when julie's that's one of the pesticides that yeah. is used in in ranching it does a lot of long-term damage um and one of julie's prime desires was not to use any pesticides, any herbicides at all on the land. And so about five or six years ago, the idea of Julie and I was always to get kids. My background is partially in education as well. Just get kids using the land farm to table. Mm -hmm. But to get to the stage where we have a farm to table possibility in the garden, we had to uh, restore the actual earth. So the soil had yeah. to clean itself through this permaculture process. And now there's food that is unmanipulated, un untouched by these, these long-term trace chemicals. Wow, congrats. And, yeah, it, it, and it's, you know, back to a point we were talking about earlier, it's all about having other people 
participate. There's people with a lot more knowledge base than we have in restorative agriculture, reforestation, mm -hmm. natives. So it's all about this kind of interrelationship, people showing up, people helping us, we help them, we try to at least. Um, and everyone leaves an indelible little fingerprint mm -hmm. on us and on the land. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. so, yeah, the programs have developed from that sort of original genesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thanks for, thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you. That was, thank you for the great questions. Um, we're now five minutes after the hour, so I think we're going to wrap it up for today. Um, so thank you, Jeff and Liana, for a great discussion um, on this Nature That Nurtures Us workshop. Um, we hope everyone who joined us today has learned a little bit more about the beautiful natural world around us. Um, shortly after we log off, I'll be sending a very, a very short survey about this workshop series. So I would appreciate it if you could take just one minute um, to share your anonymous feedback with us. And with that, um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their weekend and yes. no stress, just so hopefully some time to relax. Um, and thank you again for joining us. And thank you yes. again to Jeff and Liana. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining on a weekend, everyone. Mahalo nui loa. Have a good weekend. Aloha. Bye. Bye.